Great. All right. So we begin a new year, right? I hope, how did people do in terms of, I know a lot of you were able to be here over in the holiday season. And we talked about over the holidays, what to do for no weight gain. How did people find some of those strategies? Anybody use them? Less. Less? Okay. What strategies did you use, even if it wasn't, quote, 100%? Small portions. Yeah. Smaller portions, less sugar. less sugar, and also, you know, it's not, <laughs> I never say you're not going to eat a piece of dessert on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Just as, you know, the day we did the several thousand calories for Thanksgiving, you don't wake up Thanksgiving morning and say, you know, today's going to be a weight loss day. You know, that's not going to happen. What you have to say is today's not going to be a fast extreme first weight gain days of a cascading series of weight gain days. So if you use some of the strategies over the holidays, how many people found they were able to, even if they had sweets, they were able to have less sweets less often? Yeah, good, good. Because it's not the piece of cake Christmas day, it's the five day leftovers, which then <laughs> triggers that craving cycle. Okay? The key is to keep cravings down. All right, so hopefully nobody gained 10 pounds over the holidays, bravo. <laughs> and now the whole tsunami of food that happened from the second week of Thanksgiving to the 2nd of January, God willing is over and now we begin the new year new results so why doesn't everyone you have a piece of paper take a moment and think what do you want to accomplish in the next three months in this quarter in terms of your health your fitness your well-being lose weight have more energy be more physically fit eat less sweets cook more at home one two three cooking or Diner cooking, as I define it. Where do you have more? Where I don't have, who's in, okay. I think they were put out somewhere and Courtney's oh, okay. in charge, so there might be somewhere. Okay. So, you know, the problem with eating healthy is when you eat unhealthy, it sets up a cascading effect that you want more and more. Now, how many people looked at those original um, tapes where I took out the sugar and I said, this has 10 grams and this has 20 grams. I'm not gonna repeat that and do it today. But what you wanna think is if you have simply one teaspoon of sugar, that's one little packet, that's four grams of sugar. And one little packet, if you put a little packet of sugar into a cup of tea or coffee, you're not going to say, you know, I didn't need anything sweet. You're going to say, I put a packet of sugar. If you put two packets of sugar, you'd say, God, that's probably a lot. If you saw someone put 10 packets of sugar in a cup of tea or coffee this much, you'd say, God, there's something really wrong with them. <laughs> but the sweets come in the hidden forms. Fruit juice, orange juice, this much orange juice is over 30 grams of sugar, eight teaspoons. And that includes, quote, the organic kind, the cold press kind. And just because it's, quote, green, doesn't mean it's healthy. It just means they've put some green vegetable probably into something sweet with pineapple juice or apple juice, because if it were all kale and greens, how would it taste? Wouldn't be a big seller. So where else are the hidden sweets? Fruit juice, dried fruit, I have so many people. Cranberries, how many people here have actually tasted a raw cranberry? Booze, how does it taste? <laughs> Bad, bitter. So what do they do to cranberries? they inject sugar into cranberries to make it a little extra in your salad, a little extra with your chicken. You might as well have little cubes of sugar in it, but people wouldn't buy little cubes of sugar, so they disguise it as cranberries and they say, very healthy. 
Remember, healthy is not a category. I'm gonna repeat that because that's gonna give you a structure today, tomorrow, next year, and the year after. Because every week between now and June, there's gonna be a new, this is really healthy, right? Nuts are really healthy, right? But what are they? A healthy, for those who've been in the class before, are they healthy weight loss food or healthy weight gain food? In reality, weight gain, because unless you're eating 10 or less, or if you eat a, a, a hundred grams, three and a half ounces, so that's about a third of this cup, that's actually 50 grams of fat. So this much, think about it, this much, I'll make a little line, this much nuts, 50 grams of fat, is the same amount of fat as 10 chicken breasts. You're not gonna eat 10 chicken breasts even if you're starving, okay? So nuts are a fat. Are they bad for your body? No, but they're not primarily a protein. And it's not that I'm talking about nuts particularly, but remember, we wanna get out of this category of it's a healthy food. Because generally when it's a quote healthy food, it's a newly advertised food. Because what's driving the information? a book and a book has to be exciting you know i i tried to write a book and i wrote a book i had like the first four chapters and i had a friend who knew someone an agent and they said you know this is a great book i'd love to meet you but it's not going to sell and i said why isn't it going to sell they said because it's the truth <laughs> so people want some hidden concoction how can you lose weight take some kale <laughs> juice take some broccoli juice throw a little nuts put some coconut oil, make this concoction, and I guarantee you do this and you'll lose 10 pounds in four weeks. People buy this idea because they hope against any reality for a miracle. So miracles do happen, but they happen with the facts, managing the facts and the commitment for the results. And that's what I want to encourage everyone to do. And as you know, you can send me questions, comments, logs. I've communicated with some people. It's part of the program that Griffin has sponsored, Pam has sponsored to make this successful for people. Okay, so four grams of sugar or less. That's the foundation. Why is it the foundation? Let's review. When you eat a sugar or sugar products, orange juice, Odwalla juice, frozen yogurt, etc. your blood sugar spikes, you get that rush, you get that energy, and what happens two hours later? Great. Two hours later, your pancreas, in response to your blood sugar falling, in response to your blood sugar rising rapidly, has to secrete more insulin. And insulin is a hormone that converts calories to fat. So if you eat a calorie, do you want it to convert to fat quickly? Or do you want it to burn? You want, it to con you want it to burn because if it converts to fat quickly and you end up not just, quote, weighing more, but having a higher percentage of body fat, fat metabolizes slowly. So you want the opposite. You want foods that help your body burn the calories, have an even energy, and keep you going over time. And the, what, if you say, I can own, if you want to start out, quote, slowly, which there's nothing wrong with that, where you want to do one thing to improve your well-being, it's stay away from sweets. Now, I'm not saying this is easy, and I'm not saying this is not about breaking that social, cultural habit. I made this for you. We're all having dinner together. How can you not eat my homemade apple pie, cheesecake, blueberry muffin, French toast, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna be heartbroken. Well, the truth is you're not gonna be heartbroken. You're gonna be heartbroken if you eat this. Okay, <laughs> four grams of sugar or less. The second thing is managing the starches. Now, you know, what's a starch? Let's go through what a starch is. Bread, rice, potato, sweet potato, corn, 
quinoa. A lot of people say quinoa is protein. Quinoa has protein, but it's primarily a starch. Beans and lentils. People say, oh, beans are a protein. Beans have protein, but at the same time, they're also a starch. Now, I'm not saying don't eat starch. There are lots of, quote, diets out there. People say, I'm never going to have bread. I'm never going to have a potato. How long do you think that lasts? The first four weeks of the year, <laughs> like going to the gym. You know, never go to the gym the first three weeks of January. By the second week in February, it'll be pretty empty. <laughs> okay. So I don't believe in a no starch diet because the body needs the balance of proteins and carbohydrates and some fat. But that doesn't mean it's free. So I'm saying about 30 grams per meal. That's what I call two traditional slices of bread. I mean, you have to be you know, over 40 to remember what quote a traditional slice of bread is because we don't get traditional bread anymore. We get a bagel, right? <coughs> How many pieces of bread in a bagel? Five. Why? Because I think I brought a bagel in here once. You know, they're about as big as a, a plate. Well, then it's not gonna be two pieces of bread or what bagels used to be traditionally, 160 calories, what is it gonna be? 400 calories. Okay, you go out, you get pasta. It's always a double. Even if you order a half portion, it's probably more than a single. If you look at a box of pasta, so people say to me, oh, I eat whole wheat pasta. I say, really? And do you think whole wheat pasta has less calories, less carbohydrates than regular pasta? People say, but it's good for me. That's the same category as it's healthy. Good for you and healthy is not a category. Categories are proteins, fats, carbohydrates, how much in each of these category or things that have two categories. But healthy and good for you is not a category. If you cut through that crap, pardon my French, you'll understand that you can manage your foods using thinking, using intelligence, not going for the newest advertised for this week, this month, this year. Okay? So you can stay, quote, in control and go down the lane of healthy, strong living. Okay. So starch, 30 grams per meal. That's a small potato. Not, as I brought in a couple months ago, a supersized potato, which is a football. It's about three quarters of a cup of rice, even pasta. Very hard to do pasta because we buy it in 16 ounces and you really have to divide it appropriately to keep it at about one and a half ounces or 30 grams of carbohydrate. Okay. Now, if someone says, Janet, I really want to lose weight quickly, effectively, it's the first of the year, I want to kind of a boost, I want to jump start. One thing that is helpful is to double the vegetables and get rid of starch at dinner, not all day long. Because when people avoid starch all day long, A, they're hungrier, so they're gonna crack sooner or later, or B, they go to what they think of as free food, the fat. I had a client just a month ago. He exercised a lot, he never ate bread, he never ate sweets, and he said, how come I can't lose weight? You know why? Because he was eating a thousand plus calories a day from nuts because nuts were healthy, nuts were free, they were unsalted, and this is all great. What difference does it make? Okay? Are people kind of getting the drift? So, for weight loss, and I think January is a good time to kind of boost it up. A lot of people do, I don't know about <coughs> this crowd, but a lot of people do a January um, pause in drinking right? Because December tends, to be, <laughs> December tends to be an excess of drinking month. 
So a lot of people say, okay, I know I relaxed. I know I had a little too much in December. January is my pause month, which is not a bad idea because you're not saying I'm not going to drink, which of course is unrealistic, but you're saying I'm going to put a halt on it. I'm going to shift gears and then come February, God willing, I'm going to be able to integrate this without too much of a slide up. But in terms of the starch, really easy to double your starch rather than have, I mean, double your vegetables rather than have your starch in the evening. And that does really help if you want to get on a good weight loss track. How many people feel that's some of their goals for the next three months? Like, yes, I want to take the five, 10, et cetera <laughs> off. And I want to do it without too much of a hassle. So if you thought of three steps you're going to do, what, what's so funny? <laughs> no comments. All right. I won't make anyone embarrassed. All right. So not having double vegetables really makes the difference. Because if you don't have the vegetables and you don't have the fiber, you're going to be hungry. And, you know, if you're hungry, you're not going to stay on track too long. This has to be an easy relatively easy plan without counting a thousand things, without too much of a hassle that you can just integrate in the process of everyday living. Because if it's too many counting, oh, a calorie has more sugar than broccoli, forget it. Okay? Does this make sense? Does this seem, how many people feel they could do two things? No sweets, no double starches. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. And you know, will even, you, right? <laughs> even if you can do that alone, it makes a huge difference. Okay. <laughs> then the fourth thing, limit fat. Now, fat is harder because you can see a potato on your plate. You can see four pieces of bread on your plate or two bowls of pasta on your plate. What you can see necessarily is the five to 700 calories of added fat particularly in restaurants. How many people here actually prepare their meals at least four times a week? Good, good. One, you save money. Two, you save calories. And three, you can buy better quality food ingredients when you make it yourself. Because the restaurant world, the fast food world, the takeout world, is always going to keep the quality down to manage the costs. So saturated fat. Saturated fat, you want to not have over 18 grams a day. Now, where are the really, I think earlier we did the, the um, early in the quote, let's call it semester, <laughs> for lack of a better word, I handed the, th the uh, folder about cholesterol and saturated fat. So where are the high saturated fats? People often think of eggs as high in saturated fat. Truthfully, I wish it were eggs that were the worst offenders because we don't eat that many eggs. Sadly, cheese, cheese, and you know, cheese is, I happen to love it myself, cheese is delicious. And you don't have to cook it, you just have to slice it. And it's so easy, you have one slice, and it's good, it's got a little salt, you have another, you have another. But cheese per ounce, now, you might say, what's an ounce? Everyone can kind of visualize what a slice of American cheese is. That's an ounce. So if you have an ounce of full fat cheese, you can easily have six grams of saturated fat. You have two slices of, of cheese, you've got 12 out of your 18 grams of fat, saturated fat. So the high saturated fats, cheese, bacon, sausage, fried foods. And remember, you can have a potato chip where the label says no cholesterol, but that doesn't mean it has no saturated fat, okay? So you wanna actually <coughs> look at the label and see what the facts are. But the biggest one is cheese, pizza, pasta, sandwiches, eggs, you know, cheese does make everything taste better, but it's a lot of fat. So there are several ways to do it, to manage it. Either A, have less, or B, there are some decent 
lower fat cheeses. How many people have tried the Cabot low fat cheese? It's not bad. Or some of the better string cheeses, which are also nice because they're in individual portions, which always makes a difference. Okay, so that's the saturated fat. And then total fat, you can have some total, you can have fat, but you wanna have more of the fat from the monounsaturated <coughs> fats. So olive oil, a small amount of avocado, not a half an avocado three times a day. And don't fall into, these are good fats. Good fats are as fattening as bad fats. The only difference is good fats don't break your body down. They only cause weight gain. And bad fats cause weight gain and break your body down. Okay? All right. Okay. Did everyone write down a first quarter goal? <coughs> Because you want to have something practical that you're going to do and that you're going to track your own results rather than drifting. You know, you want to have a defined goal that you can measure the results for. Less sweets, manage the starch. Now the third thing, some people say, you know, I can eat less sweets, I can eat less starch, but I'm hungry all the time. And the antidote to the hunger or the antidote to the cravings is protein because just as sugar and carbohydrates are short acting fuel, i.e. they raise your blood sugar quickly, cause your blood sugar to fall several hours later, protein is a long acting fuel. It breaks down slowly. It gives you more energy throughout the day. So if you had a big presentation, a big project, when I see young people who are taking the SATs or other long exams, I say, have a big piece of salmon and a small sweet potato for breakfast, because that kind of super fueling will keep your brain going over a longer period of time. Most people do way better with protein in the morning as a way of giving your body a foundational place so that your energy stays even and you don't start that over fueling with the sweets or the carbohydrates. So let's look at some ideas. What can you do for breakfast? And I'm not saying don't have a starch because we talked earlier about keeping the starches about 30. Eggs, eggs, egg white combination, Low-fat cheese, plain yogurt mixed with fruit. You can use two tablespoons of walnuts or almonds or slivered almonds, cottage cheese, stir-fry tofu. Now, some people say, I got to have something quick and easy. I'm running out the door. So if you're running out the door, maybe you do have a cold cereal without a lot of sugar, like a Cheerios or a shredded wheat, or you make a quick hot cereal, but then you know at 10 o'clock, I'm going to have to give my body a protein boost rather than a carbohydrate boost. And certainly people here can keep in the office, in their refrigerator, a yogurt with their own fruit, a cottage cheese with their own fruit. If you're dairy intolerant, have, you can buy the 100 calorie package of nuts and a piece of fruit, but the protein will fuel you in the morning. And then that'll prevent the overfueling later. Managing added fats in restaurants. This is critical because we do, culturally we do more takeout, we do more food as entertainment on the weekend. And the problem with eating out is essentially two things if you're sitting down. One, portion sizes are double. And not only is the volume of the portion double, but the fat that is added is probably triple because what is fat do to food? If I had a chicken breast and I used no fat, it's going to be tasteless. If I use a ton of fat and a little cheese, it's going to be very yummy. 
So you don't want it tasteless and you don't need it necessarily very yummy. You want to do something in the middle. But when you have the restaurants, the restaurants have to, you know, seduce you to come back again and to have it better than the competitor. So to have it better than the competitor for the same quote dollar, they say, aha, we're gonna give them a bigger portion size. Therefore, we're going to encourage that people say they quote, get their money's worth. And they're gonna make it very tasty. So they might say, you know, let's say normally you'd have a piece of fish and you might put butter on it. Oh no, we don't use any butter never use butter. We use olive oil and then we add a few things. Maybe we put pancetta in it. Maybe we put cheese in it. Maybe we put um, anchovies in it. What do you think all these things are? Fat. And every gram of fat has nine calories. Now I hope this isn't sounding too depressing. Is this sounding <laughs> depressing? Because the good news is that you can actually have tasty food within these categories. And most of the time when people say, oh, I love food, I, because mostly what I do is individual counseling, I look at people's diet logs and it's not that they're going to, you know, terrific restaurants and eating yummy food. It's that they're eating leftover day old kids pizza or stale popcorn or something they don't like, but when I say, well, why did you eat that? They said, oh, it was there. You know, think about how many times you've had X, not because, oh, I really want X or God, this is delicious, but it's there. You know, if you just didn't eat it because it's there, it's a whole different mental thing. But that means unlocking or untying that automatic piece in your brain because you know, studies have shown food captures our brain. And if we think about what's, what is America's biggest addiction? Meaning it's everywhere because people can't live for five minutes without it. Sugars and double starches, wrap a little fat, wrap a little salt, wrap a little flavoring. You know, I'm sure some of you can remember when there were like four kinds of potato chips. Now there are 40 kinds of potato chips. You know, I've spoken to people who come here from other countries and they go into the grocery store and they're like totally freaked out because they can't make any decision. There are 100 cereals, there are 40 chips, there are 50 cookies. Because people in laboratories are sitting figuring out how to combine sugar, fat, and salt, and flavor, and crunch. So if you think of like an M&M, hard on the outside, crunchy, and then creamy. And that triggers the brain like, I want more. I must have more. And your rational brain can't overcome that, right? Once you have one, I don't think, you know, maybe one person here out of the whole crowd, and I'm not gonna include myself in that, can have, you know, three M&Ms. You have three M&Ms, you're gonna have 30 M&Ms. Or you have one potato chip, you're gonna have 30 potato chips. Especially if it's in a big bag, in a big container. If it's in a small container, you have a fighting chance to just finish that and not open another one. You know, for those who've heard me talk about Brian Winsock and his studies on, we eat to the bag. You know, you have, he did the experiment with the, the never ending soup bowl and people just kept eating. And the students ate the stale popcorn. Why? Because it was there. So once you know, <laughs> this is how my brain operates, you have the ability to not go down that automatic road. And if you don't go down that automatic road, you can start to get to your first quarter goals, okay? But without protein, you're not going to be able to manage, okay? So then it comes to lunch. Now, it's the dead of winter. How many people just want a salad for lunch, right? Nobody. So what do I recommend in the winter, as opposed to, I would say something totally different when we were here in May. You can buy a basic canned soup or some of the higher quality soups, which usually there are two kinds. They're the creamy kind or 
the starchy kind. So the creamy kind, there's not a lot you can do with it. But if you have something like chicken noodle soup or a black bean soup or a lentil soup, and you keep it to one portion, and you know I am getting the starch in the soup, then what you can do is bring a chicken breast or bring a piece of meat or lean ham, chop it up, take 30 seconds, throw it in the soup, and there's your lunch. How hard is that? I'm not talking about making a homemade soup. I'm talking about quick, easy working days. Or you make from home a basic sandwich. Or you have a corn or a small tortilla. This tortilla is not the same as that tortilla. This is a double, that's a single, okay? So you put chicken in it, you put salsa in it, you put vegetables in it, and you heat it up. Because in the winter, people want foods that are warm, okay? Now let's say you want a cream soup, or let's say there is a cream soup and you look at the label and you see, gosh, this has you know 18 grams of fat of which 12 of them are saturated. What do you think you could do to have it, still have taste, and not get all that fat. Cut it so in the back? Cut it with water. Cut it with water, or even cut it with skim milk. You know, you put half that fat into it, you add some skim milk, you brought the fat down 50%. Will cut it with water um, reduce the sodium at all? Or? Well, if you use half the amount, yes. Absolutely. Because if you had a let's say a cup of Campbell's soup, which has 900 milligrams of sodium. And, and remember, the jar is actually, two, the, the, you know, the aluminum jar is actually two cups. So if you had two cups of Campbell's soup or any soup, it's, two, it's your whole day sodium. It's 1,800 milligrams of sodium. So if you had a little less than one, and then you put water in it, you're cutting it down. And then you have a fighting chance that the rest of your day has a more normal sodium amount. But even for the cream soups, what I do if I have something that has some cream in it at home, I dilute it with skim milk. So I pull the fat down by half automatically. And then you have more variety. You don't have to feel, I'm always eating the same thing. And skim milk sugar though? Okay, that's a good question. Skim milk, as all milk, has 12 grams of sugar. In my 30 years of working with people as a nutritionist, I have never seen anyone's blood sugar spike with a glass of skim milk. Because, yes, that would have... My, my question would be more along the lines of what's the benefit of the skim milk versus the vitamin D? I mean, of course, the vitamin D has more fat you but, mean full milk? Yeah, okay. uh, you're gonna have more fat in the full milk, but I was always told that skim milk has more sugar. Skim milk does not have more sugar. All milk has 12 grams of sugar per cup. Mm -hmm. Skim milk probably raises your blood sugar a little more than whole milk or faster because you don't have the fat to manage it. But this is such a minor problem in the scheme of things, unless you're drinking four glasses of milk, that it's really irrelevant. Yeah, so like someone like me, milk is a huge part of my diet. Uh, and I switched, I used to be all skin, but I switched to whole. And when you say a big part of your diet, how many glasses do you drink? Four, about six, eight? About four a day. And okay. I, I make a large latte and then cereal is a big thing. Okay. So here's the thing, you don't want to have your blood sugar spike, that's one lane, but every glass of milk is going to have about five grams of saturated fat. You also don't want to eat foods that are going to spike your cholesterol. So the only way to get the answer of how that works for you is making sure A, you do get your cholesterol checked, because some people can do the full fat milk. Now, do you eat cheese? No, 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 I mean I do, but not, not often. Okay, so the key is also, is that the only place you're getting the saturated fats, or are you getting the saturated fats? I wouldn't 
<coughs> drink four glasses of whole milk a day. Now you could try doing half of that and half 2%. Yeah. So skim milk is not generally a problem for spiked blood sugar. Yeah. Uh, so uh, like uh, the difference between, uh, you know, uh, a whole milk and a skim milk is not substantial. Not for your blood sugar, but unfortunately for people who are fat sensitive, the whole milk, more than a cup, can be problematic. Okay. And that depends also on your family health history. If you, some people, if you have a history of heart disease or high cholesterol in your family, you have to manage foods differently than if you don't. So it, it's not just simply, is it a good or a bad food? But who are you? What's your genetic makeup within the context of the food? And you always want to say whatever your family negativity or how bad health history is, that's what you want to avoid. Because that's the most likely thing that's going to happen. Okay, does that answer it for other people as well? So the added fat in restaurants, I always suggest, but we'll, we'll do that later. So that's something you want to manage. Define snacking. What do I mean by define snacking? If you have a bowl this big, what are you going to do? Eat half of it, finish it off later. Everything can be bought in individual, 100 calorie, smaller, kitty size packages. Even apples, you know, you go to the store and the apples are like this. Is that an apple or is that two apples? It's two apples. So you have to, and this is part of, you know, the non-personal part of this challenge. I always say to manage one's weight, there are two parts. One is you, each individual, me, you, your neighbor, your friend, your family member. What are my cravings? What are my weaknesses? But that's only half the challenge because we live in a culture that creates weight gain. It's not like you have to go out and buy these things. It's not like you go to the restaurant and you say, you know what, give me a double order of pasta with extra cheese. Mm -hmm. You just order a basic, but a basic is a double. I, I, I can't change that. I can't make it better. You just have to kind of know it and then either have appetizers, take some home, make smarter choices. But define snacking. It's not that you never want a snack. And I think a snack in the afternoon is a good idea. Most people cannot fuel themselves enough at lunch to last till work, commute, cooking, getting home at six, seven, eight at night. Doesn't work. So you need, but in the snack, you want to have a carbohydrate and a protein. Okay? Not just a carbohydrate. So like chocolate and peanut. <laughs> no, like fruit and 100 calories worth of peanuts. Okay. So, and I think in the information that's in the Griffin earlier um, class of this series, we have a food plan that people can review. It's still all up, isn't it? Because we did the grocery list. How many people have reviewed the grocery list and the food plan? Okay, so for those of you who haven't come to some of the original classes, I believe that was in the first class where I did the grocery list so you don't have to, people don't have to think you have a plan and, and different levels of a food plan. Okay, control <coughs> your home environment. Studies show that if you have cereal, pretzels, popcorn sitting out, is that gonna to lead to success or less success? There's a whole theory of, quote, thin by design. It's not that you eat less by having a big plate and saying, I'm gonna eat half. Does that work? Does how many people have found that as an effective strategy? Doesn't work. But what works is finding a smaller plate. Because just as food has gotten larger, plates have gotten larger. 
you know, most people would call this, right, a small cup, right? But this isn't actually a cup, it's 12 ounces. That's a cup and a half. It's kind of shocking because most people would say, yeah, that's a cup, that's a small cup. It's not a small cup, it's actually a large cup. But we've lost the concept of large because we've gotten to over large, so this is small. Same thing with plates. So you want to have a clean environment. So when you walk into your kitchen, your brain doesn't go crazy. There's the pretzels, there's the popcorn, there's the cookies, there's the big bowl of almonds, because then it's all free, which of course it's not, but people think it is or hope that it's not. Okay, so eat sitting down in the kitchen or the dining room. You know, if you have 40, if you say, I eat in the car, I eat in front of the television, on a bad day, I feel depressed, I eat in my bedroom, um, I eat all over the house, then every one of those places, the brain goes, Whoop, this is a little place to snack. This, you know, when I go to the dry cleaner, there's a, there's a bakery next door. I've got, I always get the cookies. Or when I go to the movies, what do I get? Popcorn. I mean, how did popcorn, why do you have to have popcorn if you're watching a movie? We don't know the answer to that, but we know that we do it. That's the only place the movies makes money is in the popcorn. And of course, the popcorn is, you know, large, larger, and enough for an army. <laughs> so you want to say, I eat in the kitchen or I eat one other place. The worst is, and what's the biggest thing at night? You're tired, you've had a busy day. I'm sure nobody here is stressed, but tired is okay. Um, in front of the television. And when you're eating in front of the television, I guarantee you there's no reality to it. It's like that calming of my hand, my mouth, my problems disappear for these five minutes or these 20 minutes or this half hour that I'm consuming A, B, or C. The world disappears. I can't believe I ate the whole bag, <laughs> right? So don't eat in front of the television. Now, people say, what about the games? What if, you know, that's like, I love, the, you know, Super Bowl Sunday. Nobody watching Super Bowl Sunday is actually playing football. Is that agreed upon? They're watching football. Therefore, they don't need a 6,000 calorie dinner. <laughs> but that sort of, uh, Super Bowl Sunday is the end of the whole season of Whatever. <laughs> um, if you're watching something, turn it off for a minute, sit down, have something on a plate, not from the jar, not where do people get ice cream? Do they sit and do they take a bowl and put it on a plate and sit and eat it? No, they open the refrigerator and you're only gonna have one tablespoon, right? You just wanna taste it. The kids had it, my spouse had it, my friend had it, whatever. I'm only gonna have one. And then what happens? It's pretty good. But you still don't say, all right, here's my portion size, I'm taking it out, I'm putting it on a plate. No, it's just one and then half of it is gone. <coughs> and then of course people feel guilty and they keep eating for what I call light bulb thinking. Okay, so you choose a spot, not in the car, car's not an eating spot, the bedroom's not an eating spot, and the television is not an eating place. Keep your surfaces clean. Get individual size snacks. Now all of these are small little dots in the equation, but the truth is they actually make a difference. Because to change one's eating habits, it's not the 10 simple rules of eating healthy. If it were the 10 simple rules of eating healthy, first of all, every doctor and nurse would be perfect, right? Because they have the facts, but that's not reality. So it's not simply about here are the 10 healthy rules of eating. I know it, I can do it, what's the problem? The problem is it's a behavioral challenge in a culture of eating is free, it's fun, I feel better. 
this is fine, but it's not free. And it doesn't make you feel better forever. It makes you feel better for a half hour. And then generally it makes you feel worse. And it's about staying conscious in your brain. This isn't going to necessarily help me. Okay. It's not going to take my problem away if I have, you know, a bag of chocolate chip cookies. Whatever aggravated me before is going to aggravate me an hour later, and I'm going to be aggravated by myself, so, by my own behavior. So now I have two problems, the real problem, whatever that is, and then my own personal aggravation. Okay, so you go to the grocery store. Never... <laughs> <laughs> going to the grocery after going to the grocery store at six o'clock at night is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> right? You're hungry, you're tired, is your brain functioning optimally? No. I always say go to the grocery store after you've eaten. I try to go Saturday or Sunday after after breakfast or delivery. You know, the new lazy man's way out. <laughs> which I was sick last week, really worked, or the snow. But most of the time I do go to the grocery store, but not hungry because everything is meant to tempt you to make that bigger purchase, that extra purchase, that unnecessary purchase. Use a list. Studies show people who have lists do less impulse buying. You have to think. You're stocking your refrigerator for a week at home and a week at work. You're not going in the middle of the week. You have to plan for the week. Read the labels, not the advertisements. The good thing is the labels have the facts. Every label says how many grams of sugar is in this item. But the important thing to remember, like if we think of the example of the Campbell's soup, you need to look and see how does the manufacturer, what does the manufacturer define as a portion size? In general, no matter what product, it's way smaller than a person actually consumes. So if you look at any ice cream, high-end ice cream, basic ice cream, all the portion sizes are the same, a half a cup. How many people eat a half a cup of ice cream? None to very few. How many people really eat two ounces of pasta or one cup cooked at 40 grams of carbohydrate? Very few. So when you're analyzing the label, you have to know what's the reality portion size. So if you get a, glass, a, a juice this big, a little bigger than this, and it says it has 26 grams of sugar, but it's really per eight ounces and it has 16 ounces, then it's gonna have 52 grams of sugar. Everyone follow that? Okay, great. Cooking, measure food. Now, do I mean you have to measure what you eat day after day? No, but you need to know what is three quarters of a cup of rice look like? And for $5, you can buy these little cups, a half a cup, a quarter of a cup and a whole cup, and you have it and you put it on your plate now. You put it on your plate, you have your rice, you have your chicken, you have your vegetable. What do you think happens if the food sits in the middle of the table and you're sitting there and talking or you're watching television and you're alone? So plate your food. Be, don't make enough for the 10 people who aren't coming for dinner. You know, make enough for that day, or if you plan, I'm having a piece of chicken now and I'm gonna take it for lunch tomorrow. But then if you eat the extra piece, you don't have it for lunch tomorrow. So you wanna make defined portions, not, oh, there's just a little, there's another half a cup of rice left over. I don't wanna waste it. Eating it when you don't need it is a double waste. So if you see what three quarters of a cup of rice is so that you're not spiking your blood sugar, if you see what three quarters of a cup of potato is, then when you go out to a restaurant or you do takeout and they give you that much, you say, hey, that's a double, I don't need it, rather than the double as normal, okay?
Now let's say you're making chicken, vegetables. Most people say, I say, how much oil did you use in your stir fry? I didn't know I drizzled, <coughs> right? Well, that's not a defined portion, drizzling. What you wanna do if you wanna drizzle is you take it in a tablespoon and then you drizzle it. And then you know what you're doing. You, use, you do want some fat and fat does add flavor. So you keep it about a tablespoon. <coughs> Eating out. Google the menu beforehand. There is no way you can do this without knowing what actually you're going to do. And then, because when you get to the restaurant, I love the way waiters, they almost, you know, they kind of seduce you into, oh, the appetizer, blah, blah, blah. And then they go on and on and on. And if you're tired, if everyone else is having, it's so easy. We made this homemade pasta bolognese. It's got a little cream. It's always light cream. No one ever says we put heavy cream in that because they know it's not going to sell. A little light cream, only a little bit of cream. Then you taste it and it's all cream. So you want to have a plan because you want to be social. I'm going to go to that restaurant, but I'm in control. I'm driving the car. The car is not driving me down the wrong road. What's the first thing they give you when you sit down to eat? Right? The bread. Right? And it's warm. And there's a little there's a little olive oil or a little butter or both. <coughs> the way to avoid jumping into the bread basket because you're starving is don't go hungry. Which means keeping up the protein <coughs> and having a good snack. If you know you're having dinner late, 7:30, 8 o'clock which means by the time the bread comes, the drinks come, it's gonna be a long time till you have your meal. You need to have a couple slices of turkey, something, a couple slices of ham, a low fat string cheese, something to hold you that you don't have three pieces of bread or a half a bag of chips before the meal comes, <coughs> okay? And that's all about not having your, you see how it, goes back to the beginning of what I was talking about, not having the sugar and double starch that spikes, lowers your blood sugar, and produces more hunger. When you get out of that sugar double starch cycle, <coughs> your hunger actually goes down. Now, you have the meal, you manage the starch. Let's say you have no bread, you have one potato, or you say no potatoes, double starch if you're on a weight loss beginning plan. But the problem within a restaurant desserts, it's not simply do I want dessert, but people eat in the same rhythm or the same time. And so you can't just sit there when everyone else is having, you know, chocolate cheesecake. Get a tea, get a decaf cappuccino, get, there's less fresh fruit in the summer, get something so you keep in the same rhythm as everybody else. Okay? Attitude for success. Okay? Because this half of it is nutrition and the harder half is the attitude. First important step, actually, I didn't write down is when you have your goal, let's say you say I want to lose 10 pounds. I have my goal. Think about what do I have to do not to actually do the goal, maybe to do the goal, I'm gonna throw out that ice cream in the freezer, but what do I have to do mentally to prepare? What do I have to change? What do I have to think about? What do I have to do mentally to be ready to say, okay, this is the project? What do I, like, yeah, I really want it, or yeah, I don't want my cholesterol too high, or I don't want my glucose too high, or I don't want my blood pressure too high, or I really don't wanna buy a whole new set of clothes. And then think about it in a day-to-day -day way. Is today gonna to be a weight loss day? If it's an average Tuesday, that's pretty, it's not that hard. Or I'm going out with friends to restaurant X, I'm going to someone's house. Is that gonna be a weight loss day? Not likely. And if you set yourself up in the wrong way and say, oh, Saturday night, I'm going to so-and-so's house or we're going out to a complex dinner, 
and then you say, well, I failed at losing weight, then you get discouraged, that's a bad strategy. On those kinds of days, as well as the holiday days, the important thing to say is, what do I have to do today to not gain weight? And believe me, that's not meaning do nothing, because to not gain weight means I have to moderate down the tsunami of the wrong foods that comes towards me, because the wrong food is coming towards everyone all the time. But it, oh, I wrote loss, lose. Yeah, weight loss or weight management day. Okay, so think in the morning before your day begins. Take two minutes. What do I have to do? This is the attitude for success. And when people have the attitude, the mental attitude for success, then their action can be in alignment with this. But knowing it's either going to be a weight loss day or a weight management day, no weight gain day, right? I, I might have a small piece of cake at someone's house, but I'm not going to have two pieces of cake. And when they say, would you like some to take home? The answer is no. Bracketing. <laughs> Bracketing means acknowledging you're never going to be perfect. You are going to eat a cookie or french fries or too much A, B, or C some of the time. So how can you know that in advance? I'm going to go off my plan, but I'm still going to succeed with my goals. And the way to do that is putting what I call a bracket around that experience and not letting it morph into the next day, the next day, the next day. You know, this sounds illogical, but many people, they eat too much Friday night at a restaurant, and then they come home, and what do they do? Eat more or eat less? They say to themselves, you know, the day's blown anyway. What difference does it make, right? I have those frozen chocolate chips in the back of the freezer, and I've been so good, and the day is blown, what the heck, I already ate three slices of pizza, four beers, and chocolate cheesecake, so it makes no difference. <laughs> As if the body works day by day, which it doesn't. Works total volume. And then it's Saturday. How many people start a diet on Saturday? No one. <laughs> okay. So they wait till Monday, and then they keep gaining weight the entire weekend. As opposed to, I ate too much Friday night. That's the end of it. I bracket it, and I keep going. You know, it always amazes me, my husband's a big sports watcher, how people can screw up in a game in front of millions of people and the next second they're playing again perfectly. They're not going home and crying, right? Or playing gladly because they screwed up once. And that's the attitude, that athletic attitude you need to, to be successful. Okay, I screwed up. I ate too much Friday night. Not a big deal. I get right back on track. Not, I blew it, what's wrong with me, I'll start later. That doesn't work. Exercise, move every day. How many people do work out in a real way? I picture this as a high workout crowd going for the triathlon, right? Manage food pushers. I mean, we all have friends, family members, etc. Oh, I made it for you. Oh, but we always eat this on your birthday. How can you change? I'm not changing. You can't change either. And you want to not hurt anyone's feelings. But you want to say, I'm not having it right now. Or in a worst case scenario, you take a smaller amount. But don't let that food pressure more, oh, you didn't really like it. You only had one portion. No, I'm full. It was great. Write down your goals. Give yourself a non-food reward, whatever that might be. And the most important thing, never give up. Because what are you giving up on? Your health, your well-being, your future, your presence, your energy. So another thing that helps is writing everything down. Keep a log. I think I sent some forms. Keep a log, have a goal, find a buddy. And using these techniques, when people use these techniques or when people do what I say, they get results.
The good news is they can get results. The bad news is they have to actually change from their old patterns. Okay, any questions or comments? Yes. Well, what would you say is a good like bread substitute? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What would you say is like a, a good like bread? If you're trying to like eliminate, I guess, starch, what would be like a good thing, uh, like a bread thing that you could eat instead of bread? Or what type of starch would be better, best to replace with the normal bread? A, a more complex carbohydrate, beans, lentils, sweet potato. You mean for breakfast, lunch, or dinner? I'll say lunch. I would have a small potato, a small sweet potato, quinoa, lentils, any kind of bean, black bean, navy beans, canelli beans, anything of that, because the complex brown rice because the complex carbohydrates break down slowly and therefore they keep your blood sugar more even. But even with the healthy complex carbohydrates, it's critical to manage the portion size. Okay, other questions or comments? Yes. How do you feel about oatmeal? Oatmeal without the sugar, not maple oatmeal, all those sweetened oatmeals in a portion size is great. <laughs> Sometimes you might put a little nuts in it or have a hard boiled egg later as a way of having protein, but oatmeal is fine when it's unsweetened. Okay, I hope this series has inspired people to take charge of their eating habits, create their goals, go towards their goals, and stay strong and healthy. Thank you for having me.